Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of this unbelievable life. I have dear friend Deisha Fritchley with me. And let me just tell you, I have known this girl for years. We played football for blondes versus brunettes. That's how I first met her. And yes, our team at the time was non-hair color discriminatory, uh, but we played football for blondes versus brunettes. Um, she has modeled for our Engage River Valley magazine. And she also rocked one of my bras for Mardi Bra. That was like oh, quite a while ago for the AIDS group in town. So I just want to thank her for her enormous heart and what she does for our community first off. But short bio on her. She is the mother of one son, Luke, who's currently stationed overseas. So much respect to the military moms. Um, I, I couldn't even imagine. Uh, she has been a loyal Alcoa employee for 24 years. She enjoys motorcycles, jeeping, kayaking, and hiking. And she says, I love my circle of friends and find that balance is so important in feeling fulfillment. And today, she's going to talk about making the most of your career, even if it's not the path most taken. They should take it away. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I wrote throughout the 24 years, the experiences that I've had. Um, when I first started with Alcoa, I was uh, freshly turned 23. And when I graduated high school, I, I wanted to be corporate PR in Seattle. And I know that's very specific, right? Um, but that was something that I just felt the draw towards was corporate, you know, public relations. Um, I enjoy speaking with people. I love, you know, engagement with people. So to me, it was kind of a natural evolution. But after about a semester at USI, I decided I wanted to go to work full time and moved out of my parents' house into an apartment and got a first time full time job. So my fiance at the time, his dad worked at Alcoa and said, hey, they're having a, a hiring career uh, fair. Would you like to attend? And so we decided that we would apply for Alcoa. And um, unfortunately, I was the one selected, not him. And I, and I say that jokingly because the position was for the pot room. And if anybody knows anything about the pot room, it's very labor intensive. And for many, many decades, they didn't even allow women to be a part of the pot room workforce because of that fact. Um, fortunately, I was the beneficiary of them opening it up to females in the pot lines. And so I was one of five women. Um, we hired, they would quit. We hired, they would quit. But there was about 300 men. And um, when I grew up, I had an older brother. So I had the experience of being able to, you know, really put on a thick skin and, um, you know, kind of slough off at anything that, you know, came my way from the guys that I worked with. But um, I, I grew up in Evansville. My parents worked at a local factory. So I was used to the industry and some of the highs and lows. And I knew that, you know, growing up, there were times that, you know, things were tight and, and that was a result of being, uh, you know, chained to the industry and manufacturing. So it, it has a cyclical, you know, type of uh, uh, up and down. And so whenever I was younger, my mother decided she was gonna go to night school and become a journeyman. So she got her, her journeyman's card in model making. And to me at the time, I just thought, oh, it means mom's not home a couple nights a week, not a big deal. And then when I got older, I realized that she was actually, you know, sacrificing to make that investment in our family and not have the strikes and the worry and the hourly, you know, issues that, that she had at the local uh, manufacturer that she was with. So when I became a supervisor in 2004, um, Alcoa really made a push for women in leadership. And I was approached about being a supervisor. And at first I was hesitant, you know, um, I was the age of the children of most of the people that I worked with. Um, I was told often, you know, this is no place for a woman. Um, you know, if you were my daughter, I wouldn't want her working here. And I always just kind of rebutted with, well, it's a good thing I'm not your daughter. And so for me, it was just really about knowing that my mom made the sacrifice to better her family. And so I decided that if I was a supervisor with a Fortune 500 company, if anything happened to Alcoa, I had that to fall back on rather than just an hourly position. So I knew that I needed to advance my career. Um, without having a college degree, I wasn't sure how that would go. And so I was afforded the opportunity. So I was a supervisor for five years in the pot lines. We worked a 12 hour rotating shift. Um, when I had my son, I was given my six weeks maternity leave and put right back on the floor. And I was you know, labor intensive. I was exhausted. I was, I was emotional. Um, I was all those things that a new mother experiences. Oh, by the way, you have to work an extra four hours. So it was a 16 hour day with a newborn at home. And really that time period influenced me to only have the one child. Um, you know, 
I, I feel like if I would have had a different circumstance, would I have had more? Maybe, um, you know, but at the time, that's what my decision was for me. And, and I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm comfortable with that. I love my son. Um, he's my world. So Nikki, you know, thank you for the, for the army mom shout out. Um, but after a decade of rotating, I decided that I really wanted to be home nights and weekends. And, and that was the draw maternally that, that I was experiencing. So I discussed it with my husband and we made the decision that there was an administrative role that was open. And that administrative role was actually a demotion in the eyes of the company. It was a lower pay grade. It was a lower um, annual salary. So I really was, you know, on the verge of not going for it because I had started to kind of progress to a leadership role for the crew in the plot lines. And they said, you know, you, you are on the track to become the crew leader, not just a frontline supervisor. So I was, I was kind of, you know, working my way up through the ranks there, but this is what I needed for me. And so my personal life really kind of took the forefront and, and after 10 years in the plot lines, I moved to that administrative role. During my interview, though, I was cautioned not to stay there long if I still wanted to proceed through the ranks in the in the Alcoa system. And, you know, it was looked at it was it was looked at as a, a lesser of a role. And so that was my hiring manager. They gave me that advice. And I was like, oh, OK, that kind of stings a little bit. But, you know, it made me rethink how am I going to get to a manager role and to to really just have that drive without a college degree. I had to combine a couple of roles, had to, you know, keep saying yes to different opportunities and, um, you know, anything that came my way, I would accept. And so really it was just about, you know, my work ethic really helped to escalate the attention that I was getting from managers. And they said, well, Daisha can take this project. So I started taking on projects and, and that exposure helped me to kind of make it known that I wanted to be a manager, even without my degree. Um, I had college tuition assistance that was offered then. And they said, hey, you know, we'll, we'll pay for this. If this is something that you truly want, let's talk about it. Let's get you what you need. And I really thank the sponsorship that I received at the time from my manager for that. Um, so I became an HR business partner. And then my next progression was going to say, okay, HR manager. And I never thought about really going back to operations. I felt like I had, I, I felt like I had left operations and moved into that administrative role. And I didn't think it would be available anymore. I thought, okay, I've written that. I've, I've cut ties. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to accept me back. And we actually had an interim opening in the pot room for the pot room manager. And so they, they tapped me and they said, Daisha, we want you back down there. You were in the pot lines for 10 years. You understand the ins and outs of the HR piece. Now you've got a little bit more, um, you know, experience under your belt as far as the people piece. We just need to get you the behind the scenes, second level leadership. And if you want to be a manager, this is the opportune moment to take it interim. And I was like, oh. I'm, I'm not ready for that. I, I'm, I haven't been in the pot room in 10 years. I'm not ready for that. And it was literally the vice president of rolling and my plant manager, uh, two males that encouraged me, right? So typically we see that, you know, 60% of qualifications, a man's going to say, I'm, I got the job, right? But we as women kind of, you know, hold back unless we're 100% qualified, right? So if I don't have 100% of the skills they're looking for, I'm not even going to try for it. And that's, that's where I was. And they were like, Daisha, you have to do this. You, you can do it. We won't let you fail. And, and had it not been for the support of those two and the encouragement, I, I never would have thought, okay, yeah, you know, it's interim. What's the worst that can happen, right? Um, so I held the interim position for six months, and then it was offered full time. And so I was happy to be the first pot room manager, uh, first female pot room manager for the location in the 60-year existence. And to me, it was more about the culmination of my start in the pot line, when I interviewed for the supervisor, they said, where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? I said, right there in your spot. And he kind of giggled at it. You know, I think he liked that answer. Um, and then 15 years later, I literally was the property manager in his spot. So it was, it was kind of like the, the apex of my career and all with, you know, the thought of taking the sidestep and doing what I needed to do for my family. I really felt that was going to hold me back and keep me from progressing. So I was at odds with the decision, but it's what I needed. And then I thought that I had to go the traditional female route in the human resources, you know, more administrative type people thing, and, and really thought, if I'm going to grow, this is where I need to grow from. And then I was able to go back into operations. And once I went back into operations, um, I was able to take that, that empathy and really that, that piece that I think we as females, you know, embody and embrace a little bit more and, and use that to really make connections with the people on the floor. And, you know, so that is one thing that, that 
the feedback I really got was, you know, hey, you know me by name and, and I know everybody by name, you know, and it was one of the things I prided myself on when I went back to, back to operations. So it, it, it sidestepped. I think people are afraid of that sidestep. And I think that sometimes when you see the end result, maybe you think you have to go straight there. You've got to get the degree. You've got to, you know, go straight into the entry level and just keep progressing through the, the technical aspect, the operations aspect, the human resources aspect. But, you know, when, when I made that jump sideways to the administrative, thinking it was going to really kill any aspirations I had, I just continued with motivation to keep saying yes to new opportunities. And, and it allowed me then to have exposure to people that, that said, hey, no, we want you back in operation. So I, I think it's important, um, you know, to recognize that it's not always the, the normal path that you may take. And when I was first asked about um, speaking to my career development, it was for a high school teacher group that came in to see manufacturing opportunities. And then they would go back and tell their students about, you know, hey, this is this is available to you. And um, when when I first got asked by our communications department to do it, I, I really didn't think much of my career. Um, you know, I was like, oh, I didn't have a college degree. I don't really have anything to contribute other than I worked my tail off to get here, you know. And and that was really when I first was told, no, really, it's it's kind of impressive. You know, you're the first female pot room manager. Um, you don't have a college degree, and yet you've been at the same place for 24 years and continue to grow. And so for me, that was like kind of an aha moment that, you know, we we do have a story to tell. And, you know, hopefully some somewhere somebody is saying, hey, college isn't really for me. I'm, I'm never going to really go anywhere. I'm, you know, if I don't go to college, I'm not going to make anything of myself. But, you know, I'm, I'm here to say that, yes, you can. You just got to have the drive and, and the will to continue to grow. So, um with that, though, I would like to just give kudos to the opportunities I've been given with Alcoa and, um, you know, people like Nikki that are making a difference in the community. So I am very blessed to have found you those many years ago with our Blondes versus Brunettes. So thank you so much for that. And um, I, I just I really encourage anybody to kind of keep trying, keep keep climbing that ladder and uh, and breaking that glass ceiling. One of, one of my favorite things that um, the last thing I want to touch on, one of my favorite things that I used to say to the interns that, that I had, the female interns, I would say, find your voice, find it early and make sure that you're asserting it. And then I saw a TED talk not too long ago and it said, we have a voice. It, you know, when we tell people to find a voice that, that we have a voice, we just need to learn to use it. And so I can't encourage you enough to, to lean into the conversation and be part of it. Um, I was with my peers in the lead team. I was the only female, 10 years younger than every other one. And so I wasn't truly with my peers um, however, I, I didn't let that stop me from making sure that, that my opinion was there, that my voice was known, and, and I was part of the conversation. So I, I just encourage that for anybody. Um, but with that, thank you, Nikki, for having me today. I do appreciate it. And if you are interested in a career with Alcoa, please visit alcoacareers.com. Everything is posted by location, so feel free to submit an application. And thank you again. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Well, and what I want to add to that is in what you're sharing about this sidestep and getting you to this amazing place that you're at, that's completely what I've done. And I am so grateful. I feel that layering of experience can create something strong and important and inspirational. And I love your story. And I love that you have added to tell people to say yes to opportunity. I literally did a talk yesterday and I told, you know, the group that I was speaking to, to just not miss out on those and to grab them every chance that they get. So thank you for your amazing, unbelievable life. I'm so appreciative to have you on the podcast today. And I thank everybody for listening. Again, um, you guys can hop on the website if you're interested in a career at Alcoa, or you can reach out to me to reach out to Daisha. Again, phenomenal woman right here. We love her to pieces. So Daisha, thank you so much again. And again, thank you, everybody. And have a blessed and wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.